Starting in the early 1990s, there was a renaissance of interest in biological research on sexual orientation. To some extent, this was probably a function of new technologies coming online, which allowed a lot of old questions to be re-examined. At this point, people who try to claim that there is no evidence at all for biological influences on sexual orientation are simply th saying things for which there is no basis in fact. The cumulative evidence, which has been building since about the early 1990s, has all pointed in the direction of some kind of biological influence on sexual orientation. Notions that the childhood environment or the rearing styles of parents influence sexual orientation have now been around for the better part of a hundred years, if not for a hundred years. This is a very long time that people have had to bring forward hard data that would persuade everybody that there is at least some contribution of early family environment, and yet in all these decades, nobody has come forward with any hard data that is proof that there is, in fact, a positive contribution of family environment. In the field of genetics, there are the studies that compare uh, similarity of sexual orientation in identical and fraternal twins point towards some genetic contribution. The studies that have shown that homosexuality tends to run in families point towards some biological contribution. And now that the DNA research is starting to be published, this is a bench science confirmation that there probably is some genetic contribution to homosexuality. Similarly, there are uh, some, some kinds of research that bear on hormonal explanations, in particular research that now pretty reliably indicates masculinized finger length ratios in lesbians points towards some kind of prenatal event uh, that is associated with homosexuality and argues that the homosexuality itself probably also has prenatal origins. And the work that I've been doing which is uh, work on older brothers and homosexuality is also beginning to point towards some kind of prenatal congenital influence on sexual orientation. The research has pretty consistently shown that uh, gay men tend to be very slightly shorter. A difference in height between gay and straight men per se would not be of much interest. It's only of interest in the sense that it's an indirect marker that whatever happens to cause homosexuality has some biological cause, some prenatal cause. I knew a hot research finding when I, when I saw one and I realized that although I really didn't know what, what could it possibly mean that gay men had more older brothers than straight men? I thought it had to mean something and that it was interesting and worth pursuing. It took me a long time to formulate what I thought might be a reasonable theory of why older brothers increase the odds of homosexuality in later born males. And the theory that I finally arrived at had been suggested in rudimentary forms by earlier researchers, but hadn't received much attention and really wasn't influencing my th own thinking that much. I felt that what almost certainly had to be happening was some kind of a maternal immune response because the mo it, it looks as if the mother's body is in some way remembering the number of male fetuses she's carried and ignoring the number of female fetuses. And the only part of the maternal body that has that kind of memory, except for the brain, of course, is the immune system. So I felt that the epidemiological data indicated that there had to be something in the mother's immune system that was clocking down the numbers of male fetuses she had previously carried and was somehow changing the uterine environment for later males. So the full-blown theory goes like this. We know that there are certain proteins on male cells 
that either have counterparts in females that are different or have no counterparts in females. We also know that fetal material gets from the fetus into the maternal circulation, especially at childbirth where there's a lot of tearing of maternal tissue and a lot of uh, fetal material gets into the woman's circulation. So I hypothesized that may, tissue from a uh, cells or cell fragments from male fetus get into the mother's circulation. The mother perceives these male substances as foreign and develops an immune response to them in the form of antibodies. These antibodies now cross the placental barrier when she has another male fetus and affect the male fetus in such a way as to partially affect differentiation of the brain in a male typical fashion so that the part of the fetus's brain that controls sexual orientation is left in the default position of sexually preferring males rather than females. Many times when I've presented this research to audiences, somebody says to me, well, what about only children or, or gay guys who have uh, older sisters but no older brothers. How would your theory account for that? And the answer is my theory doesn't account for it and I've never tried to account for it. I've been very explicit in my research to say that I think that the fraternal birth order effect only accounts for some proportion of gay men. And I did two studies to get at this uh, question. One study estimated the proportion of gay men who are gay because of older brothers at around 15 percent and a second study which used a different sample and a different statistical approach estimated the proportion of gay men who are gay because of older brothers at around 29 percent. I don't think the exact percentages matter but the take home message here is that the fraternal birth order effect accounts for a minority but not a trivial minority of gay men. So firstborn gay men are obviously caused by the other 70 or 85 percent of factors that cause homosexuality which could be uh, many different genes acting together or possibly hormone levels that fluctuate at just the right time in the right way. I was never trying, uh, my theory is not intended to explain all of homosexuality in men. It's only to explain some portion uh, that got there via an older brother maternal immunization route. Even after the second or third time that I found results indicating this excess of older brothers in gay men, I still had a hard time with it because it just seemed so bizarre to me. So I, I kept doing the same study in effect over and over again. It was, you know, after I had done it five or six times, I was always looking for one more sample to look at it again because I needed a lot of subjective, subjectively convincing myself that something this odd could be true. Uh, so I, it wasn't like at some moment I said, aha, I've shown it. I, it. I had to talk myself into believing it. And so there came a point at which people were, friends were kind of making fun of me, like I couldn't stop. That I, I kept looking for another sample to do, to show the same thing over again. And they would, would say to me like, you know, you've shown it already, you can stop now. But I always wanted to show it one more time because I, I thought, Something this odd requires an exceptional amount of data to believe it. So much more data have built up showing the relation between older brothers and homosexuality and from so many different countries that people kind of have to say, uh, yes, this must be true. And along with the, the data now seeming inevitable, people became more accepting of the idea that a maternal immune response was a plausible explanation. However, there still has not yet been a laboratory demonstration of this phenomenon and in fact the very first study that would approach this in a laboratory way is only now being conducted.